Today we are going to talk about chronic pelvic pain in the adolescent, followed by a talk on chronic sexually transmitted infections in the adolescent. How many of you like to take care of teenagers? Many don't, but I think it's actually quite a lot of fun. And so what we're going to do today is talk a little bit about how to talk to a teenager and how to make sure that when you have a teenager in your practice, you don't miss a significant problem. So in the first talk I'm going to give, we're going to talk about chronic pelvic pain. We're going to cite the prevalence and common etiologies of chronic pelvic pain, describe the symptoms and physical exam findings associated with chronic pelvic pain, and briefly discuss psychosocial issues and steps in the evaluation and management. The definition of chronic pelvic pain is that which occurs longer than six months, which has a significant effect on the daily function and quality of life. And interestingly, it includes both the reproductive and non-reproductive pelvic pain that can be acyclic. Overall, 15 to 20 percent of women aged 18 to 50 years of age have chronic pelvic pain that lasts over a year. In the adolescent patient, almost 5 percent of all office visits between the ages of 11 and 21 are for abdominal or pelvic pain. Almost 30 percent of gynecologic visits are for pelvic pain, and 30 percent of laparoscopic procedures occur in those with pelvic pain. And the reason for pelvic pain varies widely, and it depends on where you practice. For most of us that take care of the adolescent patient, it is dysmenorrhea, or painful periods. But it can also be endometriosis. And one of the important things about endometriosis is that it can occur in the adolescent patient. It isn't one that occurs in older women only. In those who are sexually active, it can occur secondary to chronic pelvic inflammatory disease, and other causes which need to be discussed are other gynecologic issues from the genitourinary tract, the GI tract, neuromuscular, or psychological origins. And again, the most common causes of chronic pelvic pain in the adolescent patient include dysmenorrhea, or painful periods, endometriosis, Mittelschmerz, which is the pain that occurs at the time of ovulation in the middle of the cycle, other less common causes include adhesions, torsion, chronic PID, retroversion, pelvic floor pain, visceral hyperalgesia, and ovarian remnant syndrome. 40 to 90% of adolescent females will complain of dysmenorrhea at some point during their adolescent life. And up to 45% report missing school or work. Interesting, it happens after a girl has started her period for about six months. So that means it occurs in young women who have been menstruating for about six months and then begin ovulating. So the initial part of the menstrual cycle may not be painful, but after ovulation begins, the cramps start. There's two kinds of dysmenorrhea. There's the primary kind, which occurs basically once the period starts with ovulation and the secondary type of dysmenorrhea, which occurs usually more often in women over 20 years of age. And again, this can be secondary to endometriosis, malformations of the uterus, or infections. The non-gynecologic issues can be from the genitourinary tract, so it's very important to ask about these types of symptoms. And they can be due to urinary retention, nephrolithiasis, or chronic cystitis. And again, lots of women who present with chronic pelvic or abdominal pain, it can be due to a cancer in the abdomen, irritable bowel syndrome, partial small bowel obstruction, diverticulitis, or hernias. Other non-gynecologic causes include generalized myofascial pain syndrome or fibromyalgia. Very important to know that chronic pelvic abdominal pain can be due to depression, to PTSD from abuse or trauma, anxiety disorders, or personality disorders. To reiterate, symptoms of chronic pelvic pain must last for more than six months and definitely affect the life of the young woman. It is noted that this pain occurs during daily activities, 
and can be associated with waking at night. Important questions to ask include characteristics of the pain. Don't forget to ask questions about when the pain started, where the pain occurs, how long it's lasted, where it radiates, and the severity of the pain. Other things to ask about include what makes it worse, what aggravates it, and what makes it better. How is it related to the menstrual cycle? How does it occur over time? And how has it responded to different interventions? This is one of the most important parts of this talk, and I will get into this in the next talk as well, but it's extremely important to do a psychologic evaluation of a young woman with chronic pelvic pain. While this is difficult to do because of the fact that it can be associated with a past history of a traumatic event, says a sexual abuse or physical trauma, these questions must be asked. And it is very important to recognize that many times these women are unable to talk about this with a parent in the room. So the parent needs to be asked to leave the room so that a confidential interview can take place. And this may need to occur at the second or third visit to see you. There can be associated depression and anxiety, and it possibly could be due to the fact that they have pain for so long, which makes them more depressed and more anxious. But these things need to be discussed in order for you to do an excellent job at making your patient improve. Important questions to ask the adolescent patient are about school absenteeism, about the fact that they may not be participating in sports while they used to, and they are very much socially withdrawn from their family and friends, which is basically not the way we want to have our teenagers live their lives. Questions to be asked also include about history of counseling in the past, whether that's been effective or whether that's even been considered. When you do your physical exam with a young adolescent patient, it's extremely important to have a chaperone present if the patient requests it. And many times the parent um, is not required to be in the room. Many times the patient doesn't want the parent in the room when the physical exam occurs. So these questions need to be asked of the teenager alone. When you do your physical exam, make sure you observe the patient as she gets on and off the exam table. And also make sure that you focus on other areas of her body that may or may not include the reproductive or pelvic area. Make sure that you examine her back because many times the pain is referred to the pelvic area when it actually originates in the lower spine or in the paraspinous region or even in the sacroiliac joint region. Also make sure that you understand that there can be referred pain to the pelvis, which may indeed be associated with constipation, upper uh, gastrointestinal issues, or even hip or uh, lower leg issues, which may be referred to the pelvic area. When you do your physical exam before going right to a pelvic exam, start with the abdominal exam. Make sure you listen for bowel sounds and ask the patient to point exactly where it hurts. Many times with these kinds of pains, it's a vague, round, circular motion that the patient makes when they talk about their pain as opposed to pointing with one finger to where it hurts. And ask them to grade its severity from zero to 10. Ask the patient to map and demonstrate her tender areas by palpating with or without the abdominal wall flexed. There's a sign we learned in medical school. I'm sure you remember it. It's called the Carnet sign, which is when you have the woman flex forward, tightening her abdominal muscles. It shouldn't, um, if it still hurts when she does that, it's an abdominal wall issue, not one that occurs inside of the just gastrointestinal tract. And it's a very easy sign to do to actually determine whether this is a musculoskeletal issue or an intra-abdominal issue. Also important to do, and we do this with pediatricians often, but sometimes we forget to do this with our older patients, is examine the patient from where it's the least painful and then go to where it is the most painful, as opposed to going directly to where they say it hurts the most. And when you do your musculoskeletal exam, make sure you ask about trigger points, which points to more of a fibromyalgia 
or pain, neurologic or neuropathic pain syndrome. Ask them to point to with one finger whether there are actual points in their pelvic area, lower back, or hip, which actually hurt. And again, as I mentioned before, make sure you examine the back and also the posture. Young women that have chronic pelvic pain many times have very poor posture, where they have an exaggerated kyphosis of their upper back where their shoulders are hunched forward, and also they could have exaggerated lordosis with an anterior pelvic thrust of their pelvis and their hips pointed and, and, and buttocks pointed backwards. Many times when our physical therapists take care of our patients, they can see a definite improvement in the pelvic pain just by working on posture. And finally, with the pelvic exam, you ask one question at a time, looking initially at the vulva and do the general anatomy exam. When I do pelvic exams, I always bring posters and pictures with me to show my patients this is what I'm going to be doing, this is where I'm going to be examining you, and this is what I'm seeing when I do your exam. And so they can look and see what's going on while you're doing the exam one step at a time. You retract the labia and walk posterior vestibule with a cotton tip applicator in the cases of dyspareunia or constant vulvar pain. Look for vaginal discharge, and if indicated, which I will discuss in the next talk, a pap smear. Use a single digit exam with gloves to determine what exactly hurts, and be very specific at asking questions about which part of the pelvic um, anatomy hurts when you're doing the exam. First with the cervix, the bladder, the uterus, the adnexa, and then the muscles around the uterus, including the levators, obturators, and piriformi. Where is this pain when you, when you ask this question, and where does it go? Does it go to other parts of the body? Again, recognizing that if it's in one area, it should stay there if there's a surgically correctable lesion. And if it's referred vaguely to other parts of the abdomen, it might be more of a neuropathic type of a pain, or even a musculoskeletal pain versus a pelvic pain. And finally, do the bimanual exam, starting again with the non-tender areas. When you do your pelvic exam, make sure that the two hands meet um, from the rectum through the uh, vaginal exam, and then you sweep your fingers caudad, talking to your patient the entire time about what you're doing and describing that it's very hard to examine her if she guards, in other words, that she needs to relax. Always telling the patient that at any time, if it hurts, tell you, and you'll stop immediately. When we do the exam, note if the uterus is retroverted. And note if there's different areas of tenderness along the agnexa, pointing more to our diagnosis of endometriosis. If the agnexa feels boggy, you can think of chronic salpingitis, which is associated with chronic PID. And again, don't forget to do the rectovaginal exam, especially if the patient is complaining of dyspareunia or dyskesia. It's important to make sure that you do the rectovaginal exam because not to do it leads to not doing a full exam and can mean that you've done disservice to the young woman by not doing a thorough exam. The laboratory studies that need to be decided upon include doing a CBC, doing an sedimentation rate to determine whether or not there's an inflammatory process going on, Always make sure that you do a urinalysis and a pregnancy test. And always make sure you do a chlamydia and gonorrhea testing by the NAT or non-nucleic acid amplification testing. If you're going to go further, the next imaging study would be an ultrasound. Many people think they should go directly to much more invasive or expensive testing, including CT or MRI. That's not necessary. The most important and most effective way of determining whether there's a pathology in the reproductive health system is with an ultrasound, both abdominal and transvaginal. If you suspect bowel involvement, that's when you should think about a CT scan, but again, an MRI scan is not very helpful in the reproductive system to determine the etiology of chronic pelvic pain. Ultimately and finally, if you need to refer to a gynecologic colleague, for a laparoscopy, that's the very last thing you need to do to determine the etiology of chronic pelvic pain.
And it depends on where the laparoscopic procedure is done, and it varies widely in different practices. At my practice at the University of Washington in Seattle, we actually have a uh, gynecologist working in our clinic, and she doesn't do as many laparoscopes as you think she might do, because she keeps telling us that it is not necessary when we think she needs to do it. And that's because the ultrasound is so much more helpful than a laparoscopic evaluation. Because what she's really looking for in the laparoscopic evaluation is she's looking at adhesions, she's looking for non-gynecologic disease, and finally she's making sure that there is or isn't endometriosis, which is very difficult in the younger adolescent patient to see because it varies widely between patients and it can be quite early and difficult to visualize. Fibroids and hernias are also less commonly noted in the adolescent and young adult patient. So how do we take care of them? I think this is probably the most difficult part of this. Once you decide this is probably something that either is due to uh, dysmenorrhea or painful cramping periods, maybe it's a mild form of endometriosis that's not visible in an ultrasound, or maybe there's a psychologic reason from past history of trauma. So make sure that you discuss with the patient at all times your diagnosis. I know that in my practice, many, many times the patient comes in with a mom and they already think they know what's going on, but I have to go backwards and ask them again, what exactly happened, how did this start, and then move forward in terms of making a differential diagnosis with the patient and the mom in the room. And if you find something that seems that there's an underlying pathology, go ahead and treat that. I like to make sure that there's a therapeutic and supportive team that takes um, care of this patient. Because these, these problems can go on for months and probably have gone on for months before you've seen the patient. So make sure that you have established a very, very supportive, interactive relationship, both with your patient and their family members, and also with your nurse and other members of your team. Make sure follow-up appointments are scheduled regularly. These patients should not be seen in follow-up only when their pain comes back, but they should be seen regularly every one to three to six months until you are able to get their pain in check. Just schedule the appointments, and even if they don't have pain, it's important for them to come back and see you, just to tell you that, because it, it, it validates that you know they're gonna get better and helps you understand what it is that they are doing to make themselves feel better. Make sure that you educate, educate, educate these patients and reassure them that you can't find any serious underlying pathology. And you discuss the difference between something acute that happened that is going on acutely with maybe a one particular period that's painful versus a chronic type of a pain syndrome, which may be going on for months and months and may take you quite a few months to make them better. I like to make sure that my patients are educated about what goes on in the central nervous system with pain. And this is a whole other topic I, I can go into at another time. So please invite me back if you want me to talk more about chronic pain in the adolescent patient. But basically what happens with chronic pain syndromes wherever it occurs, whether it's in the pelvis or the musculoskeletal system or in terms of headaches, there's a centralization component to the pain, which is a perception component to where the brain is perceiving the pain as opposed to where it's happening at the site of origin. And once I start talking about centralization and explaining it to my patients and their families, there's this aha moment when they understand what's going on and understand that they can actually get better just by knowing what they can and can't do. The psychologic component can be very stressful to uncover, and so that if I do uncover a particularly stressful event that occurred in their past, I like to make sure that I have very close by a team of psychologic experts that can help me with my patient. In terms of the pharmacologic therapies, the initial trial always includes hormonal manipulation. We use cyclic um, therapy occasionally with our, non with our um, contraceptive pills, but basically we really would rather do a continuous form of manipulation of the um, young woman's hormonal uh, axis using continuous birth control pills. And we try not to use the triphasal pills, but it's not 
to say that they're necessarily wrong, but it's very confusing for an adolescent girl to be taking three different color pills all the time. So we just have her take the one type of contraceptive pill continuously and not having a period, and she can take it continuously for six months to a year without having a period, and that's okay. Many women would prefer not to take a pill every day, and for them we used uh, Depo-Provera or DMPA, understanding that there are significant side effects with chronic use of DMPA, including low bone density, low bone density, low bone density and weight gain. However, many women would prefer to do the, month, the shot every three months. And finally, a very expensive intervention would be Lupron or an um, antagonist which we would not recommend at this point. Other pharmacologic therapies include the non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, and these should be scheduled to start as the woman starts menstruating. And it basically is important to understand that dysmenorrhea will occur at the beginning of menses and then last basically throughout. It doesn't usually continue for weeks and weeks afterwards. So scheduled use of a non-steroidal is okay, for the three to four period days um, per month, if that's what she rec wants to do. She shouldn't wait until she has pain, in other words, to start taking it, but she should start taking scheduled non-steroidals, either naproxen or ibuprofen, as soon as she starts having her period. Very rarely, if ever, do we recommend narcotics for dysmenorrhea, because we know in the adolescent patient particularly that it can lead to tolerance and dependence. And so we avoid them at all costs to make sure that they are not trying to alleviate the pain with a narcotic. Because honestly, a narcotic will make them feel better and make the pain go away. But it can lead to significant problems with dependency later. For many patients where there's an un you uncover a psychologic problem, there can be an indication for a SSRI or antidepressant. And finally, for those with chronic pain, for chronic neuropathic pain, the pain I was discussing earlier, you can use a tricyclic or anti-epileptic. And again, I usually have my pain colleagues prescribe those versus myself, but for many patients, this is very helpful. Very rarely, if ever, is a surgical therapy indicated. So this is something I wanted to make sure that I put in my talk so that you know that there are some that would recommend a surgical therapy for chronic pelvic pain, although it's very drastic to do for an adolescent patient. And these include adnexectomy, neurectomies, suspension, lysis, and resection. We find our anesthesia colleagues can help us a lot um, with acupuncture, especially if they are dual boarded in anesthesia and acupuncture. Some of them can do trigger point injections and nerve blocks. So we work very closely for our patients with chronic pelvic pain that we are unable to help with either a hormonal management, non-steroidal, or a, a neuropathic inter intervention. Very important to understand that the management of an adolescent with chronic pelvic pain involves a team. And there are multiple components of the pain that have been shown to be more effective than traditional gynecologic management, including involvement of ourselves as pediatricians, a physical therapist, extremely important, and they are our colleagues, and very helpful. I know when you think chronic pelvic or even abdominal pain, you wouldn't think a physical therapist can help you, but they can. And it's really interesting to see just how they work with the patient in terms of posture, um, and, and working on the, the back and, and the paraspinous muscles, how helpful that can be for our patients with chronic pelvic pain. Again, anesthesiologists can be very helpful. Acupuncturists are helpful. Psychologists are helpful. And I myself, in my own practice, use biofeedback, which is an extremely important therapy that I would love to come back and talk to you about also um, in terms of an intervention for chronic pelvic pain. And again, important to recognize is the return to function is an important aspect of the adolescent health that needs to be discussed and sometimes gets missed when we focus so much on the medical and we forget that they're not going to school anymore or they're not hanging out with their friends or participating in football or other sport that they used to. So we like to make sure that as part of our treatment plan, we make sure that we have a plan for them to return to school, return to playing with their friends on the sports fields, or hanging out with their friends when they go shopping. So in conclusion, 
Chronic pelvic pain lasts more than six months, has a significant effect on the daily function and quality of life in our adolescent patient. It's very common and affects up to 24% of American women in varying degrees of severity. It can be caused by a variety of factors, including gynecologic, genitourinary, gastrointestinal, neuromuscular, and psychologic causes. And we know that a multidisciplinary approach has been very effective and can be better than just using a pharmacologic or even a surgical intervention alone. It's difficult to treat, and patients need to be seen regularly and often provided much support until they achieve healing and back to their normal quality of life. I have references here if you need them, and I'm sure we can give you these later on in the talk. Thank you very much for inviting me to come to Mexico.